All right. So we are about one minute out from getting started on today's very exciting topic in our Working Parent Series. So I am joined today right. by Elizabeth so Rodriguez. We are about one minute out from getting started on today's very exciting topic. Elizabeth Rodriguez Dennehy, who is an absolute beautiful person, an amazing soul, and also crazy intelligent. She's written a book called Can You Afford to Ignore Me about gender, gender integration. And she and I started having conversations a few months ago about mommy guilt and what it means to be a working parent in 2018. And when we really started thinking about it and we started patching out all of the different challenges that are faced by people who work with working parents, by people who are working parents, and the very specific needs and challenges that are faced by working mothers. So, Elizabeth, I am so happy to be here with you again today in our Wednesday lunch series. We're getting about halfway through, but I think today's topic might actually be my favorite one. Well, um, because you are one, right? You're a working mom. And so we're happy to be back uh, with you. And as Shannon mentioned, we're taking each different um, uh, profile or circumstance in this world of parenting and having a deep dive or ha helping you look at specifics about perceptions, issues you face, and how is it that you manage through? Because at the end of the day, we want to give you tools. And today is for working moms. And when we started the program, um, we over we gave you an overview and we said you know in terms of working moms the perceptions around working mothers is she's not coming back we have to give her more flexibility her work flow has to be easier again the issue of lack of pay parity and she's not going to be part of the promotion list or the you know promotability potential because you know, who knows if she wants to stay around for a long haul. And so those are issues that working moms face. I'm going to go through a list and I'm going to turn it over to Shannon for some of her comments. And then what we will do is give you specifics in terms of what to do about this. So issues, again, as a consequence of all this interaction and back and forth, Working moms are immersed in a high degree of stress. And the stress factor not only affects your personal health, it affects your capacity to have reflection time. Many of you will say to me, what are you talking about? I don't have five minutes to think. What about, what are you telling me about having time to have a, you know, reflection time? And one of the things that we're going to help you understand is that to be disciplined to have an opportunity to think through certain things in your week will have a high payoff as a working mom and as a professional. So stress is one of those issues that you face. Housework, Shannon has made quite a few comments about that one and she will remind you shortly. Um, having to flip between being the professional and the mom. I remember when I used to have to walk into the soccer field with my high heels and have all the other work mothers, stay-at-home mothers, look at me funny. Um, and, and so even the physical transition, right? Looking something different from uh, what everybody else is expecting is always that challenge. Trying to be superwoman. And this is linked to mommy guilt. Uh, but it's really also about how is it that we put ourselves in a no-win scenario, that I have to bake again the cookie, that I have to be the one who's going to always carpool, that I somehow need to be the one who creates or does this whole um, stuff for Halloween. Um, I, we want to remind you that it's a no-win situation for you, for the kids, and it's really not giving you any value in terms of upbringing for your children. Uh, the data that we have shows that working moms, working parents, a household where both work, uh, have kids who are more intelligent, social, sociable, and successful. Uh, and the last one is 
the, the whole perception that you're not committed to come back to work. So those are the issues that moms face in the workforce. And I'm going to throw this back at Shannon so that she can sort of from the setup uh, respond or react to the, to, the, to the list, to the laundry list. It is. It really is a laundry list. And I think we've got some of these big challenges that are put upon us by society and the people that we work with. And then we have the invisible challenges that we put upon ourselves. So we put this pressure on ourselves to do these things. And, and, you know, I love the word mom petition because I think that's, that's what we're doing. We're having these invisible competitions with other mothers saying, you know, somehow she's able to get up, run, take care of her body, make her children breakfast, send them off to school, come to work, be a superstar, be at soccer afterwards, make dinner. And, and when you look at all of these things and you think, you know, that's somebody else's reality, it's not, it's just your perception of it. And so I think one of the most exciting and important things that you're gonna talk about today are techniques and tips to really manage not only that laundry list of things, but also the invisible pressures that we're placing upon ourselves as mothers. It's, and it's so true. And, and let me tell you, we all go through it. I still find women, even at my age. So typically I'm 65, my kids are both married. And I still hear some of the professional women my age um, sort of thinking about their role in parenting still as if they're responsible for certain things. So it's a hard uh, process and it's something really hard for us to sort of really sort of anchor and say what is really uh, enough in terms of loving and caring. Uh, but we will have a whole discussion about how do we define parenting in another session so that we can get into this in more detail for today. Let's start to help you understand how you manage these issues. And then as I go through the list, I'll just turn it over to Shannon for her to, you know, jump out and help us with some of the good examples that she's gone through. Um, the first thing that's really important is the following. You want to understand and make sure that you're educating people around you. And that includes family members, that you are uh, an, an engineer, you are a mother and are your wife. And that the, the, that part of passion, profession, is, is very much part of the who you are. And so one of the things that I find that working moms don't do well is, is have a, a very subtle ongoing conversation. Uh, and it help people see how easy it is in, in the context of her passion and reality, to see herself as an engineer and as a mom. And so I, it's upon you, working moms, to start to think, what is the type of conversation I'm gonna have with people? That educate them to understand how great it is to be this person, you know, in terms of the things I do as an engineer, the things I accomplish in a day, and that those accomplishments are as important as being able to cook a meal for my children. That makes sense, Shannon? It makes perfect sense, and I think it's important for us to check those all off as accomplishments. And um, while we're in this season of our lives as working mothers, um, it is still important for us to understand when and where to compartmentalize, but also when and where to have that open dialogue with other people to educate them on all of the things that we're faced with. Because many times we lose great opportunities for people to get get you, right? Get me, and so educate people. How else can you educate people? Have conversations that address the perceptions. You know, when you uh, re-enter and you have all of this, if you start to listen up and make a list of the things we're suggesting, requires rigor and purposefulness. So this is a strategy that you have to think through and make it true for you. The perception issue. You're not coming back. We can't give you more work. So how do I deal with perceptions? I address them. And so I, I have conversations like, 
you know, a lot of people think that when you come back from having your baby, you are something different and you're not as driven as you were or that you're not the same person that can take on more. And actually now I feel like I want more and there's more for me to look forward to. So however, the, the, you know, that, that narrative comes up for you. Make sure you let people know you like what you do and you see yourself in that role in the future and that you want more because that way you're addressing what people are thinking and you cut that perception at least so em enough to have other people say, hmm, maybe what we were thinking about her is wrong. Does that make sense, Shannon? Yes, that is a rule for life, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a big advocate of just coming out and saying, hey, you might be thinking this, but here's my, here's my perspective on it. And by saying, you might be thinking that I wouldn't move now that I have a kid, or I wouldn't like to take a promotion now that I have a kid, but I wanna let you know unequivocally, that is not the way that I feel. And, and that immediately puts this perception issue again in a place which is not going to control your future another one is that i always uh, and i did it ironically i did it or um intuitively i did it uh, was ask men about their parenting issues so when you have you know those moments in which people say how are your kids oh they're fine how are your kids and they say oh they're fine and then you go so tell me um with the, the job that you have how do you manage between you know, traveling so much and taking the kids to soccer. And he might tell you, my wife does it for me. I said, and so how do you feel about that? So create a conversation with men so that they start to get the idea that this is not only me, it's us, men and women. And that starts to shift perceptions again. And men start to sort of, it starts to ring a bell. Hmm, that's true. You know, and, and that you're building up that awareness. Does that make sense, Shannon? It makes perfect sense. And, and, you know, when you said that to me in preparation for today's call, I thought, why have I never thought of that? Why haven't I ever asked one of the men that I've worked with? And we all know there are many. Yeah. How are you handling it? How do you handle being a working parent? You know, have you ever baked a cookie? Right. <laughs> and our and actually, friend, who knows? Go ahead. Our good dear friend, Rachel, um, pointed out that one of her favorite mantras is, I'll always bring the paper products. And... <laughs> You know, I don't think there's a man alive that would have a hard time saying, I'm bringing the napkins today. <laughs> um, that's so true. And, and let me tell you something that from the research that Shannon and I are doing for, for this uh, program, we're finding that quite a few men are, 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 are baking or are spending time doing other things that are non-traditional. And we'll get into that topic in a short while. But again, open the dialogue with men and see what happens. 99% of the time, it's a very positive outcome on your behalf. The, the other thing that's really important in terms of educating people is making sure to describe to people where you see yourself five and 10 years from now. The moment people hear and you speak of, wow, I really can see myself in five years from now, hopefully running a business unit. And I think in 10 years from now, being part of the executive committee. When people hear you say that, again, what happens is you start to demystify, reduce, counteract this perception that you're not here for the long haul and that you don't want more. And so immediately things start to shift for you. First, you've had the chance to think what you want next, which is a conversation you should be having consistently. What do I want next? Where do I want to be? Five years from now, 10 years from now. And things might change, but to have a narrative ready is really important. And so when you have that in your toolbox, and then you're able to very quickly start to say, I want more, 
it's very hard for people not to then think you should be part of the uh, promotability group for your succession planning. Perceptions start to be reshuffled. Does that make sense? I love this, um, especially when we consider five to 10 years from now, some of us, not me, <laughs> but some of us will see our children are already moved out, living their own lives, and right. how we've defined ourselves at this critical time may right. impact who we are at that season in our lives. So that five to 10 year plan is just critical. It's critical, and, and actually, Shannon sent me an article yesterday about a woman, I could have written that article. Um, she's 65, and she said, it's, it's funny how I realize now, and I, if she's 100% sure, uh, correct, that I'm in this, this other new chapter of my professional life. Kids are gone, the issues around parenting are gone. It's a very different reality. I enjoy my adult children immensely, which I'm having a great time with that. And I have all the capacity, experience, and energy for another 20 more years. And so what, what Shannon said about thinking long-term and really getting that message into your DNA, into your emotional and intellectual DNA, really important because I can tell you there's going to be another chapter for you if you want it. Now, another thing in terms of educating people um, is find yourself volunteering for very strategic stretch assignments. Um, don't say yes to every project. Make sure that you are looking at projects that can create a good echo around your persona, that can have a good um, outbound in terms of, you know, ripple effect about your uh, perception of people, your brand, and your presence. That allows for when you have to go and have your second baby or when you're re-entering for a whole series of, again, perceptions and impressions of you to be really clear. She's very good at, she did a phenomenal job in something she was never, uh, had never done, and she did a fantastic job. So she's showing she's able to do more, all those great things. So stretch assignments that are strategically high payoff for you are critical. Have you ever, <laughs> Put yourself in that place, Shannon. So uh, I worked at a place that launched a brand new ERP system and ERP belongs in the world of finance, which is a place I do not belong. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, I was naturally going to be somewhat involved in the project, but got myself even more involved in the project because I thought for me, you know, to be a very round professional uh -huh. at the level that I'm at, I need to have a better understanding of the inner workings of finance. And mm -hmm. Um, while it was challenging for me sometimes to wrap my brain around, you know, what happens after the sale is made? What's the revenue recognition rules? You know, what are the gap accounting principles? It was amazing for me to expose myself to people that I hadn't worked on projects with, you know, that I didn't know beyond grabbing coffee together in the morning. And I think putting yourself out there in the universe and saying, I want to do these things is a really good way for you to get additional exposure. Yeah. And people immediately elevate your, your, potential in the organization. Now, the next thing for us to manage, how to manage this process, is learning to say no. And when I say learning to say no, it, one of the big ones is your commitments to meetings during your weekday, your weeks and your day. I, I, in my coaching, I always ask my coaches, the first thing I do is let me see your calendar. And then I, the first thing I do is challenge the person <clears throat> to explain to me why she has to be in that meeting. So there's something about the meeting that you have to be, and there is a meeting that can be um, uh, covered by an assistant, a peer that can give you a report, and it's starting to say no. Sometimes it's starting to say no to the teacher who's volunteering you to speak all day in an event, in which it's impossible for you to do. And negotiate yourself to say, I can do it three weeks from now. I used to do that all the time. So saying no, very important. Shannon, how do you say no? 
You know, I like to say no by giving it an opportunity to say yes for somebody else. So if I say no, but I can volunteer somebody else that I work with or somebody on my team to fill in my place, and that almost acts as a, a stretch assignment for them, it's a win-win for all of us. I've removed myself from the obligation, and now they're getting additional exposure, which will help them to become promoted in the future. That's a fantastic way. And if you can do that consistently, she, she nailed it right there because it's also the other person is looking at her. She's building trust and she, he knows or she knows that she wants to grow him or her in terms of talent. So it's a win-win. So saying no, very important. The next one, which is critical, is make sure you have great mentors and sponsors. I can't emphasize enough the fact that when you have um, this team of people, I call them your personal board, that's another conversation, but particularly your mentors and your sponsors, they're gonna be in the meeting that you're not. They're gonna be having a conversation with people uh, in your absence. They're the ones who can very well describe your aspirations and where you want to really go and how good you are at certain things. And those mentors really are critical when you're having your baby coming back and help reshuffle your re-entry. Um, or when, again, you're having your second or third child. Those are the ones who anchor you institutionally. So mentors and sponsors are as important to you as the oxygen you breathe because they really, they really help create a shield around you of certitude, of the who you are, and most importantly, they advocate for the fact that she wants to be here and she just needs a little break. And then watch her go into the C-suite, right? So Shannon, how many mentors, sponsors, how do you go about defining those key people in your life? Preach. <laughs> 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 You know, a, a part of it goes back to having that lifelong learner mindset to say, I don't know everything, I can't know everything, and I can draw on the knowledge and experience of others. And so I, I just reach out to people, and that's actually how I met you. I said, you know. here's, here's somebody I need in my life, and I think people want to help, people want to see you do better. So identify those kind of core areas where you could use somebody's advice to have your own personal board of directors. Absolutely. And so, uh, very, very important. Mentors and sponsors are critical for you. We have two more uh, suggestions on how you manage through being a working mom. And the next two are very important. Uh, you have to be strategically, underscore, strategically networked. You cannot afford to be in anonymity in your organization. We have a whole segment in another program about how you network. This is not social networking. This is not just you know, shaking hands. This is understanding who in your organization knows you by first and last name. Who in the organization knows your work in terms of the details of your proficiency. If you're not well networked, if you're only a working bee, if you're inside the weeds all the time, just you know, behind that computer, you might be putting out work that's needed and you're earning your check, your salary, your money, but you're doing a disservice to yourself and to the organization because only a few people will have access to that report. Only a few people will know Whereas the organization who's looking for talent like yours can't find you because you're not out there networking strategically to get people, again, to know you. So get uh, in your booklet or in your journal, make a note on, on finding out how is it, and it's really very easy, it's not complicated. We just need to figure out a process. But get yourself networked so that people will speak up on your behalf. Now, Shannon, you are a phenomenal networker. What are the things that you do? 
Um, you know, I, I just really enjoy people. I'm very invigorated by people and I recognize not everybody is that way, but I actually had planned today to tell you a story about somebody that I can see is on our Zoom. So I'm going to let her know right now. Yes, I am talking about you. I'm so proud of you and who you've become. But, um, you know, I had a lady that was working with me in my group and, and I thought, you can't do this forever. You're just too smart. You've got too much to offer. And so I started networking her out to other groups and introducing her to people and saying, look, she's got a really operational mind. She thinks very um, sincerely about the company. And so, you know, I was even networking on her behalf. And I think that is one of the things that we can do very well as women. We are, we are wired to work in relationship ways, which is why I think we're so great at sales. Um, but, you know, when, when you have that relationship mind, use it for yourself and say, how can I build relationships, but also use it for the other people that you know and say, I recognize you do really well in this position or with these people and make those introductions because they'll come back to you tenfold. That is so true. And I'm, I'm just going through that experience with a young person I've met and she takes on uh, making introductions for me uh, every other week. I find another, you know, introduction in my email and that's so gracious. And I, and I also feel so elegant. Um, that's such a professional way of carrying yourself. So uh, networking and when you find, I'm lucky enough to find people like Shannon, they help you. But if you don't have people like her around you, it's on you and there are ways for you to really become much better network. The last thing that we want to talk about is the superwoman syndrome. And I think we really sort of went through that um, already as we started. And so what we want to leave you with is the following. Don't. Stop. It doesn't work. It's a fallacy. Being or trying to be perfect or super mom or super woman is putting yourself behind a, a, a tremendous amount of, again, stress. And here's what we both are telling you. It doesn't have a high payback. It's of no use to you. It's not of use to your children, which is what you are trying to sort of love more or do more for. And so stop trying to do that, which you do not have to do. Free yourself from that paradigm. And so I hope that with this list of suggestions, we're leaving back with you and in your toolkit, actionable items. Take one and do it. And I can assure you, Shannon can assure you, you will do really, really, really much better. And you'll feel more engaged and easy. Uh, your life will be easier at work because um, we see those th these things work. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I love your tips. I invite everybody to go through this again and pick out your favorite one and put it into action right away. You'll start to feel better. Um, reduce your self-talk. And as always, reach out to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Rodriguez Dennehy. You can find her Rodriguez and Associates website. She's on LinkedIn. She's amazing. Um, and I'm Shannon Gregg. And we are so happy to have been able to talk to you again today. Keep sending us your questions and feedback. It helps to really shape our future modules. We just love talking to you. We just think this is something that's so important for 2018. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.